What's going on guys? It's your boy Naruto Explain here and today we're going to be doing a very, very deep dive into the Otsutsuki clan. However, unlike other Ninja Clan handbook videos I've done in the past, due to the sheer complexity of the Otsutsuki clan, its members, and how deeply interwoven their clan is with Asian folklore and mythology, even more so than the other clans in the whole Naruto series. This video is going to be longer than the other clan videos that we've done, and rightfully so. This is easily the most complex and fascinating clan in all of Naruto due to the rich Asian mythology and folklore behind their existence. And so this is going to be the first of three videos based off of the Otsutsuki clan. So getting right into it, what is the Otsutsuki clan and why do I give them such high praise off of the legends and mythology behind the clan so as we all know the otsuski are a clan of parasitic aliens who have spent eons in the universe harvesting life force and genetic material out of every planet that they travel to and the transference of power is an absolute clan law they evolve by eating chakra fruit that is harvested by sacrificing the life force of the planet that they're on this is done by planting a ten tail seedling into the planet having one of the two otsuski who travel to that planet place a karma seal onto a suitable host and then once the karma's been fully extracted into the vessel the otsuski who gave the karma to their vessel willingly feeds themselves to the ten tails which in turn sees the ripening of a chakra fruit the otsuski who is fed to the ten tails is reborn into the vessel who they bestowed upon karma and the process repeats itself to the next planet that they travel to with the lower rank of the otsuski always being the one who feeds themselves to the ten tails now this is where things get really interesting and this is where we start seeing the sheer brilliance behind the otsutsuki clan and why masashi kishimoto is an absolute madman when it comes to the sheer thought behind all of this so the mere act of the otsutsuki moving from planet to planet to grow a god tree harvest the chakra fruit it all has ties to Asian culture, Asian folklore, and Asian mythology. So Otsuski can be translated into meaning big bamboo tree, which should make you guys think of the god tree that the Otsuski cultivate when they come to Earth. The clan whose name can be translated into big bamboo tree comes to a planet to harvest a chakra fruit, just as people in the real world will harvest bamboo. Bamboo, for those of you guys who don't know, provides both shoots that can be used as food and canes that can be used as decorations giving it more than one use one can be used for sustenance and the other one can be used for decoration bamboo shoots provide substance because they can be eaten they're low in fat you get the substance because the bamboo can be eaten they're low in fat they're low in calories and they're easy to grow and they're easy to harvest and it provides high fiber and potassium they can also be blended into a few different cuisines depending on how you cook it, which is why Kagi Otsutsuki is such a fascinating character when you look at this part of the lore. Kaguya is the first Otsutsuki who we're introduced to in the series who wants to harvest the chakra fruit, which is fitting because Kaguya's inspiration comes from one of the oldest Japanese legends that was ever written, which is the tale of the bamboo cutter. In the legend, there are clear lines that point to the inspiration behind the Otsutsuki clan name and Kaguya herself. So you have Otsutsuki Tarine no Miko being the Otsutsuki inspiration. Then you have Kage Hime no Mikoto being the inspiration behind Kaguya. Kaguya. So in the story Kaguya Hime, she was a princess that was on the moon who was found inside of a stalk of bamboo that glowed extremely brightly. The man who found her on earth named her Kaguya, which is the shining princess of young bamboo. In only a few months, she grew up to be a beautiful woman with countless men who were after her hand in marriage and eventually the emperor of Japan was attracted to her. In one version of the story, Kaguya is shown looking up to the full moon and she's crying and another version of the story is revealed that she's sent to earth as being part of a punishment for a crime that she committed and in another version of the story she was sent to earth from the moon in order to be kept safe from a celestial war kaguya after she reveals that she's a celestial princess from the moon she reveals the existence of an immortality elixir. After a feather robe is placed onto her shoulders, Kaguya's compassion for the people of Earth is completely forgotten and she ascends back to the moon. The Emperor then burns Kaguya's letters and the immortality elixir on the highest mountain in Japan in hopes that the message can reach Kaguya on the moon and the Emperor does so because he does not wish to live a immortal life without Kaguya by his side. So as you listen to that, you should have made some connections to Kaguya in the Naruto manga as well as Kaguya in the 
filler arc of Naruto Shippuden. In the filler arc, when Kaguya comes to Earth, we see her as she descends from the heavens with bamboo trees all around her, and Kaguya has a celestial glow an obvious nod to the legend. Kage in the filler was shown as a beautiful woman who eventually had a man of royal status fall for her. However, the part about why Kaguya in the mythology was sent to Earth is where things get very interesting. There are different versions of the story. In one, she's seen as a princess who was sent with gold that was meant to be provided for her upkeep. In another version of the story, she's sent to Earth as punishment. And in another version of the story, she's sent to Earth to protect her from a civil war. Kaguya in the Naruto franchise has bits and pieces in each version of the story, and I'll explain to you how. So in the filler, she makes it clear to her son that there are other Otsuski who are coming for her due to something that she did in the past. In the same filler, she's shown looking up at the moon when she sits with that royal suitor who fathered her two sons, Hagoromo and Hamura, which is another nod to the myth. While there was no civil war, Boruto's addition to Kaguya's story makes it clear that there was a conflict between herself and Ishiki over the chakra fruit. However, it's something that you might not know unless you're very familiar with Japanese folklore and meanings is that the feathered robe that was placed on Kaguya has a connection to Agaromo, the Sage of Six Paths. Remember how in the myth, it was said that as soon as Kaguya had a feather robe placed onto her, Kaguya no longer had sympathy or compassion for the people of Earth? Well, Think about how Hagoromo said that Kaguya was a loving woman, then suddenly after she ate the chakra fruit, she changed all of a sudden. Well, Hagoromo, when you look into the meaning behind his name, it means feather mantle. Now, we're going to tie it in this way. So the reason why this is important is just as Kaguya in the myth was given a feather robe right as she ascended back to the moon, Kaguya in the Naruto universe, according to the filler, had a similar moment where her compassion for people was wiped clear. Kaguya, when she was betrayed, she was pregnant with Hagoromo and Hamura. Hagoromo means feather mantle and Kaguya in the myth had a feather robe. In both cases, when both were bestowed upon the feather in their possession, in each case respectively, you had a robe in the myth and you had a child in the anime. Both women lost their compassion for humans. Kaguya in the myth, she ascended to the heavens. Kage in the anime ascended to becoming the heartless monster that Hagoromo warned Naruto about. Now taking things a step further, Kaguya's other son, Hamura, also has a name that can be translated into being Feather Village. Again, another connection to that mythology with Kaguya. The feather robe that Kaguya got in the myth would have been draped on both of her shoulders. And in the anime, both of Kaguya's children were named after feathers because they were both inside of her womb. In both stories, their women lost their compassion for humanity once they were exposed to that feather. Kaguya, as we all know, possesses a form of physical immortality where no physical attacks have been shown being able to kill her. Kage in the myth has a elixir of life that gives immortality. Kage in the Naruto franchise was sent onto planet Earth to harvest a chakra fruit, a fruit that we all know has ties to the Susuke clan's biological immortality. Now taking an even deeper dive into the Otsuki, their horns can be viewed as another nod to the legend as well because their horns can be seen as symbols for the rabbit ears, where in the tail of the bamboo cutter, revealing that Kaguya was a rabbit goddess. This was also why when Kaguya lost control of the biju inside of her, when Naruto hit her with that Rasen Shuriken barrage with all the biju chakra, her body briefly transformed into a rabbit-like appearance. It was Kishimoto once again paying homage to the mythology. Now, another interesting thing of note here is that just as Kaguya's own Japanese legend gave way to connections to her sons via the two being named after feathers, Kishimoto continued with Kaguya's actions having a way to link to one of her grandchildren, Indra Otsuski. Essentially, the connection here is that Kaguya's actions in regards to taking over mankind and making them be part of the god tree via that dream world is something that loosely connects to the goddess Izanami, who was the goddess of death in folklore. When you really look at it, death can be viewed as being a blissful state and her creation of the Zetsu army loosely mirrors that of the Yomi that were followers of Izanami. As you all know, the Uchiha descendants of Indra have access to two forbidden genjutsu, the Izanami and the Izanagi. It's a loose connection, but it's one that lines up and makes the descendants of Indra, the Uchiha clan members, that much more interesting. Now, speaking of Ashra and Indra, the fascinating thing about these two is that these two half-breed Otsuski 
is that while they do have a celestial blood inside of them, they also have human blood inside of them. By nature, human beings are violent creatures. While we do have the capacity for good, at our core, we have a streak of violence inside of us. Asher and Indra, as well as their descendants, the Sinju and the Uchiha clan, they have that link to Hinduism and Buddhism religions. The Asuras were viewed as being malevolent, whereas the Indras were viewed as being benevolent. Indra was backed by the gods and Asura was in a constant battle against Indra. Naruto as a series, however, flipped all this onto its head and essentially reversed everything, with the Indra descendants being the ones who were viewed as the aggressors and the Asura descendants being the ones who were more so the pacifists, the ones that were doing the defense, if you will. But it's still a really cool nod when you look at it. Now, going even further deep into this, once Kaguya diluted her celestial blood with that of humans by breeding with humans, we saw another tie back into the legend of the Kaguya princess and the bamboo cutter story. So in Naruto the Last in particular, in great detail in the movie novelization, it was revealed that the descendants of Hamura had a civil war on the moon. The clan that was made from half celestial and half human blood eventually gave into the human-like nature of war and had a celestial civil war. This ties back into Kaguya's mythological origin because in one version of the legend, she was sent to Earth to escape a great war. And now in the Naruto universe, her descendants on the moon were at war with one another. It's another sign that the deeper you get into Naruto, the more you see the brilliance of Masashi Kishimoto. Now going even further into this, by branching into Kaguya even further, we have Ishiki Otsutsuki, who was Kaguya's celestial partner, meant to harvest the chakra fruit here on Earth. Ishiki is based off of the Ishin Boshi myth, which tells the story of the one-inch man who rescued a very wealthy girl, and in some versions of the story, a princess from an ogre, and eventually transformed himself into being a human. The Ishin Boshi myth has directly planted the seeds for the inspiration behind Ishiki Otsutsuki, and I'll explain to you why. The symbol on his back and the symbol on his chest can be viewed as a reference to the wish-granting mallet that Ishin Boshi came into possession of inside of that myth. Ishiki's dojutsu, the Sukuna Hikona, allows him to shrink himself and other objects down to one inch in size. The mouth that Ishin Boshi has was able to make food and treasures and other objects appear out of nowhere. Ishiki's other dojutsu power allows him to summon other objects from a different dimensions, and he's made food and wine appear out of thin air, a clear nod to that aspect of the folklore, even if he wasn't actually making a wish, at least as far as we know. While he was also controlling Jigen's body, Ishiki had Jigen tell a motto that all of the wishes of the car and her members would be granted at some point after the chakra fruit was harvested, which is a clear nod to the Ishin Boshin legend. However, one fascinating thing about Ishiki and the mythology around him is that we also have the wish granting mallet. So Otsutsuki revived themselves via karma. We all know that. So as I've stated before, Naruto as a franchise is notorious for double meanings if you know where and how to look for them. The karma is a perfect example of this, and it ties into Otsutsuki as a whole. The kanji spelling can either come down to K-A-R-M-A, -A, or it can come down to K-A-M-A, -A, which is important because the latter of this, K-A-M-A, -A, has Hindu origins. In Hindu, karma means desire, wish, or longing. In Japanese, it's an alternative way to write out the word karma. Ishiki has a legend that has inspiration for the wish granting mallet. Karma can translate into K-A-M-A, -A, which in Hindu literature can mean wish. We were first told what karma was in the story when it moved into the Ishiki portion of the story where Ishiki's vessel, Jigen, was first introduced to us. And that's very important to keep in mind because Ishiki himself was inspired by a character that had a wish granting mallet. Due to Ishiki being part of the Otsutsuki clan, it makes sense for the clan to have karma, to have a wish and a longing and a desire to be immortal and to revive themselves via the karma seals. Now, taking things a step further, we have Momoshiki and Kenshiki. So many of you guys are familiar with the Boruto anime and manga version of Fuse Momoshiki the more slender frame and the demonic look. We all can agree that looks pretty badass. However, have you ever wondered why the version that Masashi Kishimoto drew in the movie looks so different? It's because of the folklore. Kishimoto drew Fuse Momoshiki with the red skin and the ogre-like appearance due to the mythology. Both Momoshiki and Kenshiki in the folk legends deal with ogres and like Kaguya, their powers, personalities, and etc. 
can be taken directly from the legend itself. Kenshiki is named after the legendary hero Kentaro. Kentaro was stated to have superhuman strength, just like Kenshiki has superhuman strength according to Sasuke, that goes beyond that of just infusing chakra into the muscles. There are several legends for Kentaro. Some present him as being the son of a princess, and others present him as a child that was raised by a mountain witch, which I think that is the version that Masashi Kishimoto drew inspiration from. That version of Kenshiki was a heavy set person and he possessed a hatchet axe. Kenshiki in the anime is tall, he's heavy set, and he wields a chakra axe, hence the inspiration. Now, Kentaro would go on adventures fighting against demons and monsters. In his spare time, he would sumo wrestle with bears and he was known to be a skilled martial artist with incredible raw strength, which is another clear inspiration for Kenshiki, who, despite his huge size, he was skilled enough in combat that he could keep up with adult Sasuke in ways you would not think that somebody of his size would be able to do. However, taking things a step further, Kentaro was also believed to be a real person who served as a retainer for a samurai and was known as a fearsome warrior. Kishimoto clearly blended the legend and the real life Kentaro when making Kenshiki as a character because Kenshiki was the guardian for Momoshiki. Now, speaking of Momoshiki, he is based off of Momotaro, better known as Peach Boy. In the legend, Momotaro was a small boy found inside of a peach that was raised by a married couple who went off to kill demons who attacked his village, and he did so with the help of his animal comrades. The dog, the monkey, and the peasant each were used as groundwork for some of Momoshiki's jutsu in the Boruto movie. Where things get very interesting is that Momoshiki's design comes heavily inspired by some of the information surrounding Minamoto no Yorimitsu. That's the samurai who Kentaro served as a retainer for, which by extension explains why the relationship between Momoshiki and Kenshiki is as how it is, and why Kenshiki was viewed as being the lower rank of the two. Where we have further influence on the design of Momoshiki is in the monk named Benki, who served under Minamoto, the monk who killed himself to protect Minamoto, much in the same way that Momoshiki was saved by Kenshiki who allowed himself to transform into the chakra fruit. The appearance of the chakra fruit should remind you of a peach, which is fitting given Momoshiki was named after the folklore about a peach boy named Momotaro. Kenshiki's sacrifice in the very elements of karma ties into the transference of power according to the clan law, which can also line up with the mythology. Even the Otsutsuki who we love to hate, Urashiki, has deeper ties than people realize. Urashiki is based off of Urashima Taro. His clothes are a direct nod to that myth, but as are his Renegon powers, everything from that fishing hook to the way that his time-related powers work with his Renegon. That's also why his major arc that we have is a part of the time travel arc because Momotaro's story can be paid homage there which is so fitting given that the time slip arc of Boruto's anime was Masashi Kishimoto's original story. Even his transformation into the bird-like creature that so many people question why it looked like it did, it came from the folklore because in the legend, in one version of the story, Urashima transforms into a crane. Urashima Taro was a fisherman who rescued a turtle from being tortured by small children and carried on his back to the dragon palace beneath the sea. And as a part of his reward, he was given the lovely princess Odahime and the two spent some grown-up time doing some grown-up things that would likely make Jiraiya's nose bleed. And she put it on him so good that when he traveled back to his home village, it had been a hundred years since he had left the sea. Now, depending on what version of the story you go with, Urashima either transforms into an old man or he transforms into a crane. However, as Boruto fans, the turtle should remind you of the time travel turtle. The Dragon King Palace and the hundred years of being trapped there should remind you of Urashiki trapping Teneri in the Dragon King Palace for a hundred years when he sealed him away there. Now, speaking of Teneri, we don't have as much to look at for his character, but there are some interesting things here. Just his name alone is a reference to the title that's bestowed upon low-ranking servants of nobility and royalty during 7th century Japan. In Boruto, when Urashiki confronts Teneri, it quickly becomes clear that Teneri wasn't of any real status because Urashiki made reference to a main branch existing, which further implied that Teneri was of lower status. Now, the irony in this is that Kishimoto could have also taken inspiration from Prince Teneri, who lived in the Nara period of Japan, which for reference to the Nara period of Japan is between 
710 and 794 AD of Japan, which is referred to as being classical Japan, and it's a few years before the feudal era of Japan. This could also explain why Teneri had a castle on the moon, though given everything we know now, Teneri was likely a blend of both of these elements due to the meaning of its name as well as the historical figure. And like I've said before, it's not uncommon for Kishimoto to blend multiple aspects of different source materials. However, that's going to be it for this Otsutsuki clan video. For this one, I want to look more so at the mythology behind the creation of the clan and tie it into the series as a whole. That way you can better appreciate what we are given with the characters instead of just giving you a run-of-the-mill cookie cutter explanation about what the Otsutsuki clan is you've all watched the same series as me i wanted to go a different route because these nuggets of lore they're what really makes naruto as a franchise so fascinating to be a fan of if you know what to look for so as always guys if you like anything i had to say don't forget to comment rate subscribe and share thank you so much for watching until the end have an awesome day guys